So we're going to talk about public-private partnerships. As uh, Natalie mentioned, that we have a, a significant uh, outreach mission in the ACI of building meaningful partnerships with uh, key organizations, individuals, and so on. Please take your seats. I feel like we're in church or something here. So, uh, so what we brought together, we brought together experts in different domains, from private industry, from government, and from uh, academia. Because there's a few target audiences that we're trying to reach out to. So we're trying to reach specifically academia because they generate knowledge. By, by definition, they are researching interesting problems and creating uh, that basic research that we could use. We're also reaching out to private industry. This is a very uh, unique space in cyber compared to other domains. If you look at air, the B-1 bomber, the F-16, the Black Hawk helicopter, the, the DOD dominates that space. If we want it to be a different color, or we want the blade or the aircraft to fly a little bit faster or carry more, we have the bona fides to go in there and say, and make it bigger, make it faster. And they will. You go to Apple and you say, make it bigger, make it faster, and they say, you are this much of our bottom line. We're going to stick with our product. Take it or leave it. Uh, so private sector in cyberspace is the leader in innovation. They are the ones who are creating the products that we are customers of. We don't dominate that space. So having private industry at the table is very important. Um, the other is intra-government or intra-DOD. This, this, uh, this event here is a demonstration of that partnership. The Army Cyber Institute, which is part of the United States Military Academy, that's DRU to DA, which everybody knows what all that means in the military, is working with TRADOC, and they're DRU to DA also. Those are two very separate commands that don't necessarily work together, but they both have a training mission, but a very different training mission. And here you see us working together. This is an example of that intra. The inter is the other government, the other agencies that may be represented. We have to also work with DHS, FBI. They have a big role in cyberspace. The last component, which uh, we are partly represented here, is the international. This is international space, cyber. If you ask a company, a US-based company, let's say City or, or Apple or pick, take your pick, they say that they're an international company. They are not just a national company. They have to operate by the rules and regulations all across the globe. So cyberspace, we have to be, find some way to bridge that partnership, to bring that team together. Uh, so let me just start with a quick working definition of what we mean by cyberspace so, or partnerships. The ability to, partnerships is the ability to interact with partners, competitors, and adversaries security institutions or relevant populations by developing and presenting cyber information and conducting cyber activities to affect their perception, will, behavior, capabilities in order to build an effective, legitimate, interoperable, and self-sustaining cyber strategic partnerships. In the military, we add the, the why to that is to have freedom of maneuver in the space, and that means that we can do the offensive, the exploitation, those other things that the DOD gets to do. And that other part is in order to build a more defensible cyber infrastructure so that we can all operate on it. So we're not doing this for partnerships sake. We're doing this so that we could build this space. So with that, I brought exemplars from these communities. So first, Bill Hutchinson, the CEO and co-founder of SimSpace, a simulation, uh, cyber simulation company. Now, Bill is also an F-16 pilot, which it's, uh, it, it's us, us fellow pilots recognize that he's the, probably the smartest guy in the room right now. The other thing that he does is he used to be, a, he's a retired Air Force officer, and he had a lot to do with the exercises that Cybercom has done in the past. So he took that vast experience in DOD from cyber exercises, also from 
uh, being an operational uh, officer and, and his fighter pilot experience, and now he's brought it to the private sector, and now he's uh, leading this effort. And I'll get into why he's here and why it was real interesting. It has to do with the exercise that uh, was discussed, Jack Voltaic. We also have uh, Josh Toman. Josh Toman is a retired Army officer. He's an expert in law of armed conflict. He's also well known for a couple other things that he's done. He's been a lead prosecutor in following the ethics violations of several individuals in uniform, uh, to include uh, General Sinclair, to include prosecuting uh, the platoon that was affiliated with uh, Danny Chen's suicide, and also um, is now an adjunct in South Carolina and works for a, uh, as a clerk with a federal judge as broadening experience. One of our panelists canceled, but fortuitously we have Dr. Dave Alberts. Dr. Dave Alberts, uh, I'm a fanboy, I'm getting fanboys here, and I actually happen to have one book in my knapsack here that's from Dr. Alberts. Uh, Dr. Alberts was a former director of the Command Control Research Project. What he did is he did a longitudinal study over a long period of time that covered multiple dimensions, multidisciplinary approach to command and control. And what's interesting is that project has since uh, been redesignated and has gone on. But what he did is he gathered that body of knowledge on command and control and looked at it, developed models, developed simulations. Has anyone heard of the term net-centric warfare? Dr. Dave Alberts. Uh, that uh, campaigns of experimentations, how to do work in this space that not only touches on academia, but also touch on how we integrate the private sector, and how do we operationalize that so it means something to those of us in uniform? And all of us who have been uh, in the Army more than, more, more than about five, ten years know that that was the doctrine, or that was, those were some of the seminal works that we had to learn and study and understand, because this is how the information age is affecting command and control, down to how we structure organizations. Take command and control out of it, and now you add cyber. We're at that space where cyber has a lot of unexplored avenues, a lot of aspects that we don't yet understand, and yet, as Brian David Johnson is saying, we're trying to predict the future. So what's the future going to look like? And so what we're hoping today is to bring some of that dialogue, some of that discourse. And I asked my panelists, as Brian David Johnson uh, stated, I use today's environment, today's challenges, as a starting point to get us to the future. What's that future going to look like? What do we need to explore today so that we are not caught off guard? So I'm gonna start with a couple of uh, leading questions and we'll go down the list here. I'm gonna start with uh, Josh Toman. We have a lot of rules. We have a lot of regulations. The federal acquisition regulation tells us exactly how we're going to do it and we all know that it takes a long time to get from an idea, a concept, or requirement to an actual product. I think everyone in this room in uniform could agree that that system is broken and we're not going to get very far in this cyberspace. It's great for how to build a tank that doesn't evolve every 18 months of being twice as fast. So, in regarding policy, where do you see the pathway to the future regarding partnerships and cyberspace, Josh? Thank you, Carlos. I think that um, the, the future, if we look at the, the 2050 time frame, uh, and we realize that the threats at that point are going to be on such a wide attack plane, the Internet of Things, um, that we are not going to be able to have that command and control um, on the responses. Uh, the, the difficulty is how do we translate today's law of armed conflict uh, in our law and policy into a way that works in the future. And, and it's going to have to um, be put forth to where we have these faster responses and authorities that allow uh, the key players, these international businesses, to have that ability to be responsive. 
uh, we're not looking at saying let's delegate combatant immunity to Johnson and Johnson. But what we are saying is that we have to come up with packets or tools that they can use in response. We have to, as the military, put forth to policymakers the arguments with academia's help, with industry's help, with our military experience and credibility to say we need changes in the law and the policy to have faster cyber response. Right now, business plays defense. They play all cyber defense. Their only offense is like Paul Blart Mall Cop, you know, when it comes to offensive cyber for, for organization. So how do we enable them in 2050 to be the ones who can respond with limited governmental authority or response to cyber attacks? Well, not on their own, and if we don't come up with a way to do it, then you'll see the rise of a cyber blackwater that's going to do those things on behalf of these companies if the government doesn't do it. We've got, we've got to kind of get out of our own way. We have combatant immunity, but yet we have a hard time getting approval, legal approval for coffee at conferences, right? So, you know, you look at the example of Gulliver's Travels and, and uh, the Lilliputians held them down with these little ropes. Uh, right now, we're kind of holding ourselves down. You know, you have to recognize that uh, there is a challenge in how we do things with procurement, with the laws, with the authorities, but we've got to engage from here, giving policymakers, here's the road ahead, here's where we need these changes, um, and sort of understand that if we want to be indispensable in the future, that we've got to accept less control over uh, certain areas of the approval process, of the development process. It's got to be a win-win, uh, not just for policymakers, but also the military. Uh, and I think that comes from recognizing that if we want to reach these threats of the future and be responsive then, uh, recognizing that we've got to get business to come to the table to see that it's in their best interest to partner with us. So again, getting business to the table, we've got to show them that we are actively looking to contribute something to them instead of being stuck behind all of the regulations and the, and the limitations and the lack of policy that allows them to um, look at what they want from the partnership. So, Hutch, your, your organization uh, has a, a platform that puts that into action. But before we get into that, what, what are some of the challenges that you see with uh, the policy, the current policy, the current state? and? Where do you see some uh, glimmers of light on where we can go in the future? Um, thanks, JC. So um, in terms of how we can accelerate uh, getting new capabilities uh, here in the military, one of the things that was started, and I believe we have a representative from DIUX maybe in the audience, but, um, and it speaks to partnerships, public and private, um, and it leverages a capability that we have already in place, which is our reserve component. Um, where you have a foot in the, the military, the government, as well as a foot in the private sector. And the fundamental problem is how can you gain awareness of um, what the requirements are that the military has, um, and at the same time, pair that up, match that, map that to a particular solutions in the private sector. Um, and so an entity was stood up, uh, led by the Secretary of Defense, uh, within the past year, where we're gonna try to accelerate uh, the awareness of what's out there, uh, to move at the speed that cyber, frankly, demands, um, but then leverage some of the unique partnerships that we already have in place, that trust and confidence um, at the community level uh, that your reserve component has, um, and then uh, uh, get uh, the requirements um, solved a little bit quicker. So, D Dr. Albert, uh as we look at the policies and partnerships, we gave a few examples. What should that vision be? Or what, what's the purpose of the vision and partnerships as we extend uh, to the future? Well, I think, I think the vision is clearly unity of effort in, in this space. And uh, as you asked me a little while ago uh, to sort of think about this and how the work we've done on command and control relates to cyber, uh, it, it, it occurred to me that 
They're so interrelated that virtually all of the challenges we faced uh, in trying to re-examine command and control in the light of the kinds of missions we were doing in which we were uh, oft times uh, uh, part of a sovereign collection, uh, that's a parallel that's here. And so for the battlefield of 2050, uh, the vision I have is that the appropriate relationships will have been built, the appropriate uh, doctrine and uh, arrangements and concepts will have built jointly between industry, militaries of different countries, and our uh, interagency partners. So as we look at this, of where we want to go, we need tools to get there. We, we talked about the policy has to be supporting, but we also need a way to get there somehow, something that we need to do. In the military, we do this already. Uh, it was recognized that a uh, rifle platoon just cannot do it all by itself. It cannot win the war. So we form these things called companies, and companies form battalions, and battalions form uh, brigades, and all the way to, to army task forces, to joint task forces, and we find some way to make it work. In cyberspace, I can't compel someone to make it work. I can't compel them to join the team. So what are some of the tools, this is to you, Hutch, what are some of the tools out there, some exemplars perhaps, uh, that we could learn from and that we could expand upon to reach that, uh, that vision that Dr. Alberts described? Um, yeah, uh, let me talk a little bit about what I was involved with at uh, Cyber Command. So, and it'll get to your, your question, uh, JC. So, um, about five years ago, we stood up an exercise called Cyber Flag. Um, it's a borrow from the aviation community uh, exercise called Red Flag. Red v. Blue, uh, large, complex um, uh, uh, events where you as best to your ability recreate a combat scenario. The intent, uh, if you will, was to um, put uh, a warrior in a wartime circumstance uh, so that the first time they um, have contact with the enemy isn't uh, on the battlefield. It's actually done in, in training. Um, and so we applied that to, to cyber, hence the name Cyber Flag. Cyber Flag is a joint tactical level uh, event where all the services uh, are involved, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines. At least that was for the first year. Um, and then we had models of good guy networks, bad guy networks, neutral networks. We had adversarial tools. Um, we had friendly tools. And then you explored how cyber could complement the transit of ships through the Gulf of Hormuz, for example. Or you were gonna have a strike package um, go from feet uh, wet to feed dry, and how do you take out IADs along the coastline? Uh, on the reverse, how can those various respective domains help cyber? So if you knew the traffic pattern um, of your adversary's uh, network, you could take out a primary node. You knew the secondary could have pre-implanted sniffers at the secondary node. Gives you uh, an intel advantage, if you will. Um, so those are some of the things that we did five years ago. Um, in building partnerships in year two, uh, we included our coalition partners. Um, at about the same time, um, there was uh, uh, a concern that the United States was gonna get attacked uh, from outside our shores, uh, and there was a great deal of concern at um, where I was at. So we, um, to prepare for that, um, we stood up another exercise called Cyber Guard, where uh, the situation was is that U.S. critical infrastructure was going to be hit, um, and then what was going to be our response? This is a federal level response. So how do you get um, not just the DOD involved, but the larger government, FBI, DHS, other agencies? How do you get industry uh, involved? Uh, and then also how do you get your reserve component? Because frankly, they're going to be part of the, the, the solution. Um, and that's where a great deal of legal and policy issues are discovered. In, Traditionally, the way the, the sequence goes in a training front 
is that you sort of talk about how you're going to handle things in a, uh, a tabletop, if you will. Um, and that's a great sort of strategic level way of solving uh, legal and policy matters. But there's also a complementary um, uh, approach where down at the keyboard level in cyber, you conduct these technical level uh, events, um, and then things surface that you probably couldn't imagine up to the operational or strategic level, if I can use the, the military parlance. Um, and I think they work nicely with one another. Tabletop early, get the policies, procedures in place. You um, sort of sort it out at a technical level, and then they work uh, sort of in a ping pong manner back and forth uh, to improve and optimize over, over time. Um, and then the, so the, the next evolution is what JC uh, just spoke about, um, which is um, really what does, when a cyber attack happens, and I believe the gentleman earlier mentioned, you know, the attacks start with people and end with people. Um, on the receiving end, it's going to be very much at the state, local level. Um, before it matures, it gets to either a regional level, multi-state, um, before the feds are involved, um, the first responders are going to be industry. It's going to be the city, local government, state government, um, critical, critical infrastructure partners. So um, there was an event uh, just two weeks ago uh, supported by uh, West Point and uh, Citibank. Um, well, we started working through what is the initial response. Um, and it will bring to light what are not just the technical shortcomings, but how can you improve command and control? How can you improve the coordination? How can you improve um, the legal and policy uh, impediments, frankly? I think it's, in many cases, the response um, isn't necessarily uh, delayed from a technical uh, perspective, but it, in many cases, it's a, it's a policy or, or a legal one. Um, so sort of a long-winded answer, sorry, JC, but the idea is, is that um, uh, it, the way it has evolved in, in DOD is we started out very much at the strategic international uh, level, then we went um, to here very much localized in the United States, and then within the United States um, with this event called Jack Voltaic, we're down at the state and local level. Um, maybe the, as we press forward, we, we press more on get it solved at the, the state and local level, and then we sort of build up from there. Uh, so that exercise, that, that exercise, am I on? Okay. So that exercise, uh, just to elaborate some more on that, was pretty phenomenal. It, it took a technical uh, capture the flag type environment. It had system administrators in a, on a simulation of their networks. It had offensive folks, which I don't know if there was any of the C3T cadets in here. So we took our competitive cyber defense team and members of the EECS faculty, and they were hacking into this network. I can say hacking in this room without being a bad word, right? Okay. They were hacking into this and, and, and having real impact. Those real impacts were then sent up to the next room, which was about this many people of uh, operations level folks who then had to react to this. And then they had to go across, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? For those of us in the military, it's a standard talk operation. We all do it all the time. Multifocus lens, reforger, all those things. This was different. This had federal, state, local, multiple sectors from uh, critical infrastructure represented from industry, all working together, all synchronized. On top of that, we had executives who were coming in and getting briefed on what's happening so that they can be aware. So it took all these different things that we do and put it in together into the, this collective training. That has challenges. Can I just ask a question? So was that uh, scenario, was that a uh, defensive um, uh, exercise, like where you're responding to threats and crisis? Okay, so unfortunately, 2050 is going to be here in 34 years. So we do not have much time to continue to just think that we can build these partnerships by focusing on the defensive. Um, you know, unless we start thinking about how does the Army fit into this future, Right? We talk about the widening attack plane. Okay, attack is not just coming at us. If I'm not mistaken, we also should be able to attack. And so how have we learned to properly deal with, you know, how are we going to impose martial law if the Internet is running? Are we going to be able to do curfews? Are we going to do the intent behind curfews in those endeavors? It's not just a one-way street. 
we've got to be able to understand how to do this defensively. We've also got to think, how are we deconstructing to do that offensively? If I'm not mistaken, Brian, you didn't come here just to teach us how to be defensive for the future, right? Okay, so how are we going to impose martial law if the internet is up? How are we also then deconstructing how do we control these similar elements? Because it's something that we also will improve our ability to do the defensive part if we start thinking offensively with these same endeavors. How do we, you know, when we're red teaming this? Uh, and, and again, that comes back to how do we build partnerships? Well, what does business want? Business wants to keep the lights on. Municipalities want to keep the lights on. Businesses want to protect their um, trade uh, secrets and things like that. So we have to think, how does business think about these endeavors? If we've got the government involved, we've got municipality involved, that's great. We also need to think about how we're we using this for our own offensive capability so that we can better enhance our defensive capability because we may need to do these other sort of things um, if there's a particular area that continues to send cyber threats or malware or hacks or whatever into um, corporations and entities, well, we've got to think broader than just we do the investigation, we find out who did it, and we take it before the UN to say, you know, bad cyber by this state-sponsored event. Okay, so to get to 2050, we really have to change what we're talking about here instead of just conferences as a result. Uh, partnerships is more than conferences. Uh, partnerships is more than, um, you know, uh, endeavors and, and be, again I like come back to we've only got 34 years so we need to start quicker and we got to look at what's already out there that we could use to enhance these partnerships um, some of the groups that I think of is uh, the corporate executive board uh, we talked about that uh, Jason uh, uh, from North or Lockheed and I were talking about that last night you know that's an entity that deals with best practices gets corporate executive to tell us what are your major challenges then they go back around what are your best practices then they go back around and say and they share that amongst the groups that's what the military needs to be doing, is getting in that, that space of what are the concerns and challenges facing corporations. They're not the ones building these exercises. We are, but we need to do it based on what they're saying. Josh, let me uh, touch on one thing specifically that I do want you to highlight. Uh, there's the issue of transparency. It's we want to have these relationships out in the open, but we don't want to share the vulnerabilities or the weaknesses that we have in our, in our defenses. How do we do that? How do we partner and cover that issue of transparency? Well, I think, I think it depends on the industry. Uh, academia would probably be very willing to be involved because they want the research dollars. They want the ability to say, hey, here's our uh, publication, here's our research. But with business, it's a different manner. Um, so, so that's where we have to learn. And again, leverage what's out there already. Speak with folks at the Institute for Defense and Business, uh, the Business Executives for National Security. These are groups that have no problem saying, hey, we're in board, uh, you know, on board and aligned with defense in looking at these challenges. If we want them to partner with us, we have to recognize that while we think about transparency and openness, that's not necessarily a priority for each corporation. Their fiduciary duty is to their shareholders and to the company. So there's ways that we have to go around uh, about that, which is engaging in legal agreements and non-disclosure agreements. They do it all the time when they align with themselves and form entities. When you formed your company, I'm sure you had legal documents for um, forming the entity and, and applies in one state and other states, but you know, you're not like giving all of that to your competitors, right? I hope not. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> so, so we can't expect the same when they come on board for partnerships. We have to recognize that if we want them to partner with us, we've got to let them be able to say, I will collaborate with you, I will partner with you, but I'm also a company. So, so I think there's ways to do it. Our focus needs to be less on talking about um, vulnerabilities and compromises and expecting these companies to come forward to us with, oh, we just got hacked, they don't want to do that. Our focus should be on creating partnerships with the emphasis on um, disseminating threat indicators. We have to be ahead of the boom or ahead of the, the malware. So okay, can I add something? Yes, sir. Okay, as Josh pointed out, it's only 34 years, and there's a lot we don't understand. Uh, we have uh, all sorts of networks, uh, communications, information, and social networks that are interdependent and interact with each other uh, all the time. Uh, an attack on one of them uh, can cascade through that. 
and uh, affect our ability to, in our sense, conduct missions, in business sense, to, to do business. And so we're not going to, we don't have the resources alone uh, to figure out all of this complexity and how to deal with it and how to build the world that's going to be here in 2050. So we have the research community, we have the business community, we have the systems community, and unless you give them a place to come and work, uh, what is a partnership? I mean, are you going to just partner on tabletop exercisers? Are you going to partner on literally building the understandings, the concepts, the metrics, uh, the rules of the road for 2050? Sir, sure, that's uh, a good lead into this follow-up here. We talk about uh, what the partnership should look like. This integrated entity, the collective. We talk about self-synchronizing, self-organizing, interdependent. Can you elaborate more on that from your past research on command control on what the optimized collective or the opt optimized partnership perhaps could look like? That, that's a tall challenge, but I, I think I can sort of lay out some things that are necessary but may not be sufficient. Uh, back in 1995, people sort of just assumed command and control was command and control. Uh, they didn't sort of quite understand that it might have to adapt in significant ways so that it would deal with uh, the challenges of uh, coalition operations, cyber attacks, and all sorts of things. Uh, there were people working in silos uh, doing small projects that never connected to one another and never answered the pressing questions of the day to inform policy or organization. And so the first thing DOD did uh, was essentially uh, articulate and raise awareness of what needed to be done, set out a certain set of priorities for things that we needed to better understand and do better, uh, created uh, an international forum uh, that was not just sort of come and, and talk, but you had to do the research, you had to have results, and that was your ticket to come to the forum, share your ideas, and form the kind of collaborative partnerships uh, that were necessary to advance research. I mean, physics today, you don't have a researcher sitting alone at a computer. You have teams of researchers who have been working decades to make progress. And so we need to be able to provide an opportunity for those teams to have a place to work, to have problems of substance to work on, to have some continuity of attention funding, uh, over the course of that period. And through that mechanism, we built a basically a literature, uh, a body of data, a body of findings, a body of, uh, you know, concepts. And uh, came to agreement on terminology, came to agreement on how to measure things. And these are the things that a normal science would have. The problem being this was new, interdisciplinary, and you just don't find it anywhere. Uh, so that's the kind of effort, and I think the Cyber Institute and uh, General Frost's organization uh, can sort of spearhead some actions to sort of, it's certainly within DOD, to sort of get us talking. Because if, uh, we don't sort of tackle the problems, understand how things work, uh, build systems that are able to dynamically adapt to disruptions and, and uh, degradations. We're gonna have a very chaotic battlefield of 2050, whether that battlefield is 
actually a battlefield as we know it or uh, in uh, servers around the world. Thank you, sir. It, and uh, it, if you see some parallels in how we're, we're going about this, uh, when we got called to build this organization, uh, I read most of your books. So, Hutch, you want to close out uh, that comment? Um, um, let's see. I, uh, w one thing I, two comments. One, um, cyber is really not much different than a lot of other things we do in the military. Um, it may seem daunting from a technological perspective, but um, principles of warfare are easily applied. Um, uh, and um, and we need to operationalize it. It's gone from a technical sort of support function to very much part of the front line. Um, and then um, uh, you mentioned you know, the team aspect of it. It is indeed a team sport. Um, it's more of a battle of minds. It's not a, a battle of uh, technologies. And um, uh, I think, uh, it, but it, it's very, very complex in that it touches a lot of areas. And so I think the, the, the battlefield of the, of the future is, is uh, foggy, it's confused, it's challenging, much like what we see today. Uh, and I think uh, in many respects, cyber encompasses that uh, because of um, it's, um, it touches so many components of what we do. Can I just make one quick remark? Of course, sir. Uh, just as an illustration of what we need to think about uh, that ties command and control, cyber, and, and other things, what we've talked about, automation, together, is that when we automate things, we are essentially giving decision rights to software. And once we've done that, the, a lot of questions arise, not the least of which is, what happens if new and unexpected situations arise? So if we think of cyber uh, in, in that context and the C2 of cyber as how we allocate those decision rights to uh, machines and how we keep some for ourselves and how we allocate them among a set of partners, that's not a bad place to start. Uh, to see who we need in the conversation and what skills uh, we need to bring to bear. You know, it, it's interesting that you, you bring that up, and I guess I failed to mention who that other partner, perhaps from 2050, should be included. Is is perhaps we need to include the bot as a stakeholder in in that discussion? And I say that tongue in cheek, but just like Dr. Albert said, is that that bot will have the ability to be autonomous and make some of those decisions for us based on what we thought to be true and how the bot interprets that, uh, that rule set. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions to, to the audience. So Ernie, I'm already from Arctic. I have a couple questions. I, I haven't heard yet uh, anything about the IP soldier, okay? Uh, I'm looking at it from the point of the futuristic point of view. Every soldier has an IP address. Just like now we have an IP address with our phones. Okay? And every weapon and every munition has to point an IP address. Uh, so when, when we start looking at the future is, uh, we're gonna be able to control, hopefully, a lot of things via wireless internet. Uh, and to us, our deck, the key thing is the weapon systems, the munition. Maybe to another, our, our deck is the soldier. So uh, we should be looking at that. How do, we, how, do we, how do we start addressing that, that individual IP address and all the individual's IP addresses that will make up that larger IP address? So Dr. Albert, you, or you wanna? Well, I'll take a quick cut and then Josh. Uh, well, actually, each soldier probably has tens, if not hundreds, of IP addresses by 2050. And that sort of raises our reliance on commercial technology, because current IoT devices uh, are not secure. And, uh, you know, you, you may think it funny, but there was uh, uh, a uh, 
an attack that was uh, orchestrated by refrigerators. And uh, it seems like refrigerators today have some intelligence built in, and the cheapest thing to do is sort of buy a fully capable chip. Well, someone figured out a way to sort of take over those refrigerators and orchestrate uh, a DOS attack. So the more that we have in terms of uh, interconnection and interdependency, the more we need to understand uh, the vulnerabilities of that and how we mitigate those vulnerabilities. Uh, so part of that is a larger command and control problem, although I, I would caution to say the word control is way optimistic. Uh, I think we can set boundaries, I think we can influence, uh, but I, I think to fool ourselves in thinking we can control these things uh, is probably problematic. Josh? I think it is difficult to try to, or problematic to think we can control it. Uh, but what I do think is it, there is value in addressing that on a individual soldier level. Uh, on the one hand, we want to, uh, from a larger perspective, look at uh, uh, cyber warfare. We want to be in a position where we're building the, the large national tools for um, uh, engaging it. But we also have to be cap uh, concerned about what about the, <clears throat> the cyber Abu Ghraib of the future? where that strategic corporal sends out the wrong, you know, type of, you know, takes the munitions and, and, and uses that to cause these uh, enormous uh, destructive impacts on uh, things that we've been working on. So while I think we are going to work on the technology and the applicability for soldiers, we've got to also remember that uh, we've got to be mindful of that cyber Abu Ghraib where the soldier uses that um, in a way that causes, uh, you know, exponential harm to uh, our operations and endeavors. Yeah, so I wanted to go back and talk about a little bit more autonomy because I think you, you, each of you made a really good point. You know, as we look at autonomy these days, we look at autonomy on land and sea, in the air, certainly autonomy in space, but I think to your point, when we look at the cyber domain, certainly autonomy is probably going, that's the, the plane where autonomy is gonna show itself first and show itself with the highest amount of autonomy that we afford these autonomous bots or these autonomous pieces of software or these algorithms. But I also agree what you're saying that as we start to look at this and we look at conflict in both offense and defense, this is not new, that there are frameworks, there are existing frameworks and ways of thinking about what we give up to autonomy, what we give up to partnerships, how we create a framework to understand both offense and defense. And I wonder if we could get each of you to talk a little bit more about that. Like how can we apply previous frameworks, things that we've seen that have worked in the past and may not work 100% in the future, but at least give us a place to start, to start having those conversations. Take a shot. So uh, when I um, uh, first arrived at Cyber Command, um, and was putting on this exercise, I mentioned Cyber Flag, uh, the uh, idea of what um, I'd learned when I was in the Middle East working air and missile defense um, uh, came to mind. And, and my point is, is that um, in, particularly in, that re uh, in the Middle East, when you're talking about uh, missile flight times of minutes, um, uh, and that there could be large number of missiles uh, targeted on one specific region, um, they got very quickly into understanding risk manage management and prioritizing. And you, you soon figured out what it is that you are going to stop and what you can't stop. Um, and it's called the PDAL, Prioritized Defended Asset List for, for folks in the audience. Um, but at the time, that didn't really quite exist, uh, at least in the, the conversations at, at, uh, at Fort Meade. Um, and so we quickly defined what is your cyber key terrain. Uh, you're just going to have to accept the fact that the adversary is going to get in your network. Um, and it fundamentally becomes a foot race to um, you uh, as a defender um, in this case. Uh, how can you get in front of the adversary to protect the most important components of your environment? Um, uh, so there, there's a direct parallel there that in that realm, um, you have to prepare for the, the worst case scenario where there's this tremendous amount of 
uh, attack surface and uh, volume of attacks your way, and then how do you uh, understand what it is that's most important, most uh, relevant to your organization, um, and then pro prioritize uh, accordingly. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think with your, your question about the autonomy, if we don't start uh, intently looking at how do we um, implement autonomy, then we're going to be faced with anarchy where corporations or entities are taking it into their own hands. So how do then do we get ahead of the spin uh, to sort of have some influence on this autonomy? Uh, and I think when you talk about traditional models, law of armed conflict provides a good framework for us. So does the UCMJ. Under the Military Code of Justice, we punish soldiers for specific deterrence, meaning you did something wrong, you're going to jail. But we also do it for a general deterrence perspective. So if we don't start putting these offensive efforts into cyber and responding to uh, attacks on businesses or municipalities or entities, uh, then we are taking that traditional framework and just letting it fall apart in the cyber domain. So, uh, and, and again, it comes back to autonomy. The military is hard with autonomy uh, in dealing with ambiguity uh, traditionally. Uh, but if uh, Lao Tzu, who's a, a famous philosopher, said, if you come with too few, we will overwhelm you. If you come with too many, you will overwhelm yourself. Uh, the same thing applies in cyber. If we try to be the only one that has this authority and has the only offensive capability, if we don't look at ways to how do we enable our corporations, entities, uh, municipalities, organizations to engage in some measure, uh, maybe not pure offensive cyber, uh, then that autonomy um, will become meaningless because it'll be anarchy because they'll do it ahead of us. So I think you look at those traditional frameworks of law of armed conflict, uh, and un again, under the UCMJ, where the view is, um, you know, not saying like kill one, terrorize thousands, but, you know, force one person to stop doing the attacks, and you can force others to stop doing these uh, state-sponsored acts as well. Um, again, coming back to the broader piece, to get these partnerships, we need to think less in terms of conferences and uh, uh, simulations, and more in terms of ongoing engagements. Uh, on a social level and think more in terms of cyber. The analogy is a lot like it's the Wild West. Well, how, does, how was the West won? With a lot of deputies that we went in and we deputized and gave people, you know, here's the autonomy. We're going to delegate you this ability to, you know, be part of the law enforcement community. That's what cyber needs to look at. How do we deputize, not just create these partnerships where it seems one way from business and the public sector? And just to follow up on, on the suggestion that we can learn from how we've done things, uh, the evolution of thinking of command and control the last 20 years has been quite dramatic. Uh, I think uh, now it's widely accepted in mission command and, and in the expressions of other services that delegations of authority are dynamic, that they depend on the circumstances and uh, the situation. And I think we have to apply those command and control lessons learned to the way we automate and the degree to which we delegate authority and not make it a hard uh, one-time delegation. But that means that we're going to need to build the kinds of control mechanisms we now have on aircraft uh, that essentially uh, regulate, if you will, based on what's happening, how much authority and autonomy to give to not only uh, software, but to individuals and partners. Uh, and it's a fairly complex thing we're talking about, but we have, at least in 2050 terms, 34 years to think about it. We just need to get more than one person thinking about it for a couple hours a day. And I think if I could close this out on, on that point, the, the phrase we're all used to is the captain goes down with the ship, you know, meaning the person in charge of the organization is responsible for the failure. But in the cyber domain, talking about the individuals and, and the importance of automation, you know, we need to be comfortable and give some teeth to the phrase, the captain, meaning two bar guy, goes down with the chip. You know, we have to think about how are we going to empower these young captains and at the forefront delegating that authority to use this automation. You know, they may screw it up and the captain will go down with the chip, but you know, you gotta put it in their hands or we're gonna be left of boom and always in a defensive posture. We got one more question over here. 
Uh, Rafael Lanera from Music Stock Ford, Brack, North Carolina. Um, got a question as far as balancing between uh, on that partnership aspect with uh, industry and academia. Uh, you all mentioned earlier that uh, partnerships from the industry would require non disclosure agreements and pretty much just watching the return on investment for stakeholder equity. And you also mentioned for uh, academia research dollars, but also how to codify that knowledge. How would you achieve that balance and how can we get to 2050 now and pave the way to actually achieve that balance, uh, particularly in this emerging field of cyber? Kratos, you know, that's cooperative research. Uh, agreements is, is the way to do it. Um, you find sort of mutual relationships. Uh, what do we want? What are they looking for? What do they bring to the table? I mean, we publish what we're looking for. Academia has its own interests. Um, there's ways to fund it. There's ways to engage in these partnerships. Uh, I think, you know, um, uh, Ernie's group, you know, helps to bring sort of uh, opportunities that may have commercial use to it. There's ways to do it. We just have to be intentional about it and we have to have a deliberate process. You know, you look at the, the mad scientist little portfolio and there's kind of three areas, very simple, disruptive technologies, human dimension, mega cities. There's this thing out there called U UASI funds, urban area uh, strategic initiatives, which is like homeland security, defensive responses. Academia wants to get involved in that because municipalities are involved in that. So how do we make that happen? When this Meet the Army Roadshow goes out, I, I didn't see anything in there where they're meeting with the chambers of commerce or the uh, city council or local universities. You know, give them the bouncy houses and give them the squeezy toys and do the face painting and let them climb on the stuff. But are we actively taking advantage? We've only got 34 years. We need to be out there saying, okay, when we come to North Carolina, we're going to meet with uh, IUBN. We're going to, you know, uh, meet with this university. We're going to meet with this chamber of commerce. And we're going to say, we want to engage in partnerships with you, not just here in this room, but when we're out there. So that's, I think, the way to do it. And, and part of that is having the flexibility. Uh, like I said, when we're used to the military industrial base and we're going to develop this, this plane and we know what we want already. Well, academia and, and industry, they get a large vote in this. And so we have to be flexible and how we meet each other's shared intent that we may not be completely satisfied, uh, but the end state, like Jack Voltaic, the exercise that we described, the end state might be much greater than we ever thought when we started. If we were to achieve what we started, you wouldn't hear us talking about this a lot and going over it. And if you, have, if you look at the traditional contract, which is not a partnership, that's an agreement and we pay for this, by contract, the private industry or, or academia cannot deliver more or less than what we told them, even if they want to. So that's the limitation of that framework that we have right now. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank the panel for spending some time with us, and I hope you had a little bit of insight on where we're going with this partnership uh, concept.